नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस Look this up. It's true. One day they're playing golf, Fidel and Che and everybody. After the revolution has been successful, and they're trying to figure out who should do what. So Fidel asks a question, and Che Guevara says, "I am." He says, "Fine. Then you can be finance minister." But the question that he asked was, "Who is an economist?" And Che heard it as, "Who is a communist?" <laughs> so that absolutely true i'm not making it up he heard it as who's a communist and he said i am and that's how he got to be finance minister he knew nothing about finance right so in some sense though it's not that accidental for me i would say that i'm also a very unlikely finance minister dr parani vel tyagarajan or ptr as he is more commonly known has had an interesting journey thus far He comes from a family with strong political roots in Tamil Nadu. His grandfather PT Rajan was chief minister of the Madras presidency in 1936 and his father PTR Palanivel Rajan was assembly speaker and minister in Tamil Nadu. PTR initially chose to go overseas and be part of the Wall Street Brigade. His experience in the financial sector stretches from Wall Street to Singapore. He transitioned from his life in finance to a life in politics. following the footsteps of his grandfather and father he was elected mla for madurai central constituency and currently serves as a minister for finance and human resources management in the tamil nadu government in this episode of bic talks ptr will talk about his personal journey and how a family legacy of politics combined with his eclectic overseas life as an investment professional has prepared him for his current role in state and national politics he also talks about how the past has shaped his thinking his learning and the value of public private cross pollination as he addresses the emergent challenges and issues of the day this episode is an adaptation of an in person event that took place in early november 2022 in the bic premises and now over to ptr i must confess i didn't really prepare that many remarks i wrote up some notes in the car on the way over the traffic delay gave me some benefit from banker to finance minister i must first say that i was an accidental banker i had no vision of a career and i did many different things i often say that in retrospect almost everything i did before i got this job adds value to the way i do this job but that's with hindsight you know i'm very different from most people i think most people i've met try to find their way through life to some unknown destination and in my case rightly or wrongly i had this kind of conviction when i was young that i would end up like my father and his father before him and his father before him and so since i had some idea of my destination i tried to find as many kind of byways and lanes and roads less traveled uh, before i thought i would end up at my destination now in retrospect the odds that anybody can do what i did which is spend 30 years away do very many things and then come back to do this job is uh, you know one in a million so you know maybe it was a foolhardy conviction but in many ways it has been the making of my life because i had the great luxury of doing things for the sake of doing things rather than because i needed to make a living or uh, have a career or make a mark or any of those things i want to talk a little bit about the pin tweet because i think that's a good place to start so i was having a conversation with a friend and i said you know in government you come across so many instances where the wrong thing happens and people are aggrieved or they are unjustly denied or you know it still gets me worked up and i think that's a very bad trait for a politician because you know injustice is all around us and i should learn to play the odds and be smart and so i often wonder why is it that i'm like that is it just that i was born a child of privilege and so i have not had to face that much injustice because i have empathy and that's my nature i think then i get aggravated by injustice to others and the friend said no no it has nothing to do with that people can come from all kinds of backgrounds and be indignant when there's injustice and wrong 
And that's the first time I got it, and I immediately pinned it. It just shows that privilege is not the basis for a lot of things. It is for a lot of other things, but it's not for everything. But I have to start with an anecdote. How many of you have read how Che Guevara got to be finance minister, or even central banker? Do you know? Look this up. It's true. One day, they're playing golf, Fidel and Che and everybody, after the revolution has been successful, and they're trying to figure out who should do what. So Fidel asks a question, and Che Guevara says, I am. He says, fine, then you can be finance minister. But the question that he asked was, who is an economist? And Che heard it as, who is a communist? (laughs) So that's absolutely true. I'm not making it up. He heard it as, who is a communist? And he said, I am. And that's how he got to be finance minister. He knew nothing about finance, right? So in some sense, though it's not that accidental for me, I would say that I'm also a very unlikely finance minister. It's very rare in the DMK, in Tamil Nadu, in India for that matter, that a first-time minister, second-time MLA gets a portfolio like finance. If you look at my own party, our founder, Peraringer Anna, the first time he became chief minister, he retained the finance portfolio. Our uh, long-term leader, Talayar Kalinger, the first three times he was chief minister, he kept the finance portfolio and didn't allocate it to anybody. And only in the last term of his life, he gave it to uh, Pera Sriya, who was also one of the founders of the party and the general secretary. So in my party, that's true. That's also true almost all the states that I know of and in India. In fact, I heard secondhand that a former Reserve Bank governor had told another Reserve Bank governor that after the success of Mr. V.P. Singh, the unwritten rule in Delhi is never give the job to somebody who can get elected on their own because there's too much power in the hands of one individual. In fact, I asked for the HR and CE portfolio. I didn't ask for the finance portfolio, let alone the human resources portfolio. Mostly those are retained with the chief minister. And so, in some sense, I'm almost as accidental a finance minister as I was a banker. But I just want to give a little bit of history, because I want people to know there's no one path to success. Nothing is permanent. And I'll end on this note as well in a different context. I was directly or indirectly invited to come to public life six times. First in 96, then in 06, then in 11, then in 14, and finally in 16. The first five times... For whatever reason, it didn't work out. There were, there were many reasons. And really, when I came at the age of 50 in 2016, I had reached that stage in my life when it was now or never in some ways, in the sense that I was 50 years old, I'd had successful careers in different parts of the world, I'd made enough money, I'd seen enough things. And it had been 10 years since my father passed. And I was worried that the coattails may not extend that much further. If I didn't come now, there was no guarantee that I would come back later. And it's a sad fact of life that when you have an electorate of about two and a half to three lakh people, and that's in the south, if you go to the north, an MLA constituency can be three and a half, four lakh people. It's very hard for you to get elected without having a brand name. There are very few first-time MLAs. I think in the last three elections in Tamil Nadu, there's not been a single independent MLA. It's almost impossible to um, create that much awareness for your personal image in that short a time. I had the great luxury both of the party's mandate and also of my family legacy. So in 2016, on the sixth kind of attempt or uh, possible entry, I was announced as the MLA candidate. And I remember many people telling me that you cannot win without paying for votes. That's basically the basis of elections. I said, listen, I came back and I made some other choices and potential sacrifices in life because I wanted to practice politics the way my forefathers had done, to do it for the people. And the signal I would send by paying was that I was here to reap a return. Nobody expects that you invest the money without expecting a return. So it's not that I can or cannot afford to pay. It's that I don't want to be perceived as a politician who's here expecting to make investment and get return. And so I won't pay. The DMK lost the popular vote by less than 1% through a lot of unexpected developments. In 2016, I won my seat by the skin of my teeth about 3.8% or something like 5,000, 6,000 votes. 
that was an earthquake in some sense because I'd done it first time candidate without paying money. I couldn't speak Tamil at that time, at least not on public stages. So I could only go around, visit people. And I learned something. I learned that at the end of the day, they will remember you if you meet their eyes and you have this connection. And so I went to every street. I went to as many houses as I could. And I'm naturally an extrovert, so not that difficult for me. And I actually found I was energized by those interactions. And so I won one election without speaking at all, just because the, I was a party's candidate. I was my father's son, I was my grandfather's grandson. I asked for a particular constituency. I asked for the Madurai Central constituency where I don't live because it has the Madurai Meenakshiman temple that my family has been long associated with and my ancestors built part of it. My grandfather did a renovation after the king's times for the first time. So there was a personally for me faith and in the public perception a continuity. And I would say the leverage of those three things together, I got elected. I vested very heavily in doing the job of an MLA. I brought in new technology. I put in a call center. When I realized that a lot of people still couldn't access the call center, I put in complaint boxes, physical complaint boxes, so that nobody would have to travel more than a few hundred meters to a box. Did the kind of layout mapping for that. Did multiple iterations of the design of the box, where located. These are simple to say, fairly complicated to execute. I started publishing six-month reports to my constituents, delivered to their home. What have I done for you? What has worked? What hasn't worked? What is pending? How many complaints have I got? How many have been processed? In the MLA CDS, I took surveys, and with my team, we did about 150 projects. That means, you know, about eight or ten crores. We probably split. Now, if you're an MLA, normally the bigger the ticket size, the better for you. If you're looking for margins or execution simplicity, then the bigger the ticket size, the sooner it gets done, and uh, it's very easy to manage. The smaller the ticket size, you know, 2 lakhs, 3 lakhs, 5 lakhs, bow wells here, Anganwadi is there, ration shops here, bus stands there, these get much more complicated. So we brought in a level of execution capability probably not seen. We ran career counseling for government school students and their parents. We invested a lot in government schools, in libraries, in computerization. And at the end of five years, I would say I was very happy in some surveys, one of the best 10 MLAs and some other surveys, best MLA. So I felt like I'd done my job. And so when the 21 election rolled around, I asked for the same constituency. My leader gave it to me. And again, I refused to pay. But this time I could speak Tamil. So this time I went around and I said, if I have done a good job for you, you vote for me. Never mind who my father was. That was last time. This time I've been your MLA for five years. Vote for me if I've done a good job. If not, vote for somebody else. And this time people told me, if you don't pay, you won't win. Lightning never strikes twice in the same place. I actually wanted to prove that it's possible that you can repeatedly win without having to pay for votes. And so I ended up not paying. And this time I won by 34,000 or something. It was like 23, 24% when the DMK on average won by about 8%. So I think for me, the most satisfying part of my political journey till then was being able to repeat as MLA on my terms through a performance track record and getting it done. Then came time for the ministry. As I said, I asked for the HRC ministry. My father had been HRC minister before. My grandfather had been HRE minister in the Justice Party days. My granduncle, Mr. Bhakta Ochalam of the Congress, had been HRC minister, HRE minister. And my great-granduncle had been one of the leaders of the Justice Party, a vice president and a founder, who had pushed hard for the nationalization of the king's temples and the cultural icons so that they could be preserved. So I felt it was in my domain or legacy. And I was junior minister. I'm 26 out of 34 in the protocol because they do it based on when you're first MLA, when you're first minister and these kinds of things. So I thought it would be an appropriate fit. I was completely flabbergasted when my chief minister allocated me all these administrative portfolios, finance, pensions and benefits, planning, development and special initiatives. And what we call HR, HRM, Human Resource Management, is actually what used to be called personnel and administrative reforms, which includes the recruitment, which is the Tamil Nadu Public Service Commission. It includes the training institutes. It includes the right to information. It includes the vigilance, the Department of Vigilance Anti-Corruption. It includes the Lokayukta, all of that. So, you know, it was a huge, huge responsibility, and it continues to be. But the whole point of coming to public life is that you want to improve something. You want to get better results than you used to see. 
certainly in my case, when I was in opposition MLA, the performance of the government deteriorated rapidly between 2014 and 2021. I'm, st- I'm just talking statistically, I'm not talking about politics now. Uh, we went from being a revenue neutral state to having every year a new record revenue deficit, a new record fiscal deficit in percentage of GSDP terms, in absolute terms, every way possible. And the system just started to decay and rot. I think the greatest lesson I take away from that is sometimes if you have 10 years of the same party, the system goes out of balance. And in this case, it was not even the same party alone. It was the same party minus the leader, because the leader was convicted in 2014. She lost two years of the first term, and then she passed away at the beginning of the second term. So the lesson I take away from that is that at the end of the day, if you don't have the mandate of the people, you certainly don't have the courage to facilitate or enact change. And that the living example was Tamil Nadu government from 2014 to 21. That was the cause, and the decay was the consequence. But change is very hard. Right? Change is hard in the best of places. I was a change agent all my life in Lehman Brothers, in Standard Chartered, as a consultant. I started my career as a corporate and a management consultant. And change is very hard because it's not in human nature to want change. Right? Most of us struggle to find a place and figure out how to optimize the environment we're in. Once we've got it all figured out, the last thing we want is to have many things change on us, and then we have to figure out some new paradigm, some new model. But in the case of corporate entities, the market forces change because the world is changing all the time. And if you don't have the capacity to keep up, you'll get left behind. But in the case of governments, it's not the same. There is no, once you're elected, you have five years. There's no real pressure. Of course, by the time next election comes around, everybody belatedly starts getting worked up about the elections. But otherwise, there's no inherent requirement to change. Maybe with the exception of these days, the way the union government tries to constrain and constrict the states, you have no choice but to actually improve because they're bearing down so hard using all kinds of clauses and terms that have never been used in the past that you can't really afford to be like even 1% off your game. If you are, then you become beholden to them uh, immediately after that. I'll get into the math in a minute. So... We have this situation where we have to change if we want to get better results, but there's no natural pressure to change. And then in the organization, as I'm the HRM minister, we have a problem. We can't use any carrots and we can't use any sticks. You do really well. I can't promote you. I can't give you a bonus. I can't do anything if you're even an IAS officer. Let's forget down the ranks. And if you don't do such a good job, I mean, you're going to get promoted based on the time period anyway, right? So in practical terms, I joke with my, uh, my finance secretary that uh, we were making some estimates for the revised estimate when we were presenting the second budget, this, this year's budget. And he said, we should peg the deficit estimate here. And I said, no, there's no way we'll hit that estimate. We'll peg it here. And he said, no, but if we peg it there, what happens if we don't hit it? I say, I mean, I worked with numbers all my career. I'm a, I'm a banker, right? I know there's no way we can exceed this number. He said, yes, and then we went a little more, a little more, and then it became clear. He said, well, if we set it here this year, then next year will have to be better than that, and the projection for next year will be better than that. We just have this ratchet effect where we're putting ourselves under the gun to deliver better and better and better. And uh, if we set it here, then we give ourselves some leeway and we can, you know. And at the end of the day, I had to agree to what he said because as I told him, and I told all the finance department, IS officers were there, I said, if this was a bank, I would have told you, we'll set the number at the right number, and if we do better... I'll give you an extra million dollar bonus. And if we don't, I'll say, you and I shouldn't do this job. Let somebody else do the job. But here I have neither the carrot nor the stick. So whatever you say goes, we'll go with that number. Of course, we went with that number. Of course, when the final account came, it was much better, not only than his number, it was better than my number by several thousand crores, right? And it's a wonderful job in some ways because I learn something every day. It's so new to anything I ever did before. I lived 20 years in the US. I lived 10 years mostly traveling around the world as a global head in a different bank. (laughs) And I ran into a gentleman who was uh, one of the key administrators of then chief minister of Gujarat, uh, who is now a prime minister. And he was senior executive at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And he told me, so the way we talked about it always is that if you want to affect change, you need to have political will and administrative skill, right? So that's, that's the two components. You've got to have somebody with the courage to say, I will take on change, I will take on the consequences of it, and I want to deliver results beyond where we are today. And then you must have the capacity to actually execute and deliver that. At some profound level, that's true. 
right? And I think the political will obviously has to come from the people. Now, there are people who will win a 50%, 60% majority and still worry. Oh, what if the people think this way? What if I do this too fast? What happens if the consequence is wrong? And then there are people who have 35 40% mandate and say, you know, I can do whatever I want. The people elected me. So, you know, there's a range of interpretations of what is the will of the people. But it also requires some kind of inner strength, the core of leadership. And it requires, most of all, ambition. Right? It's very, very easy when you get into the system to get lulled by the trappings of power, to get lulled by, you know, all the kind of bending and flags and security. And, you know, you're still minister five years. I mean, in a state like Tamil Nadu, it's a 300 or plus billion dollar economy. It's 80 million people. If it were a country by itself, it would be 19th or 18th largest country in the world. It would be 30th or something largest economy in the world. Minister in that is not a small thing, right? But if you let yourself get complacent, if you let yourself get kind of absorbed in that, then you'll never be able to drive change because it's so easy to be thwarted when you try to do anything. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the way our system is, it is basically designed and structured to fail in the absence of exceptionally talented, competent, high integrity leadership. Right? And what do I mean? I mean, the core of democracy at a very kind of economic philosophy level, the core of democracy is to ensure participation for all and reduce inequality. That's our day job. That's, you know, economically speaking or financially speaking, our day job is to ensure everybody gets a share of the pie, everybody gets a share of the uplift, nobody gets left behind, and the social fabric is not ripped apart by increasing inequality. I gave a lecture in Mumbai, a memorial lecture about three or two months ago, where I said that the single greatest threat to the notion of democracy today is high and rising inequality all over the world, right? Now, there are also other issues. If you take places like the UK or the US, the racial makeup of the country is changing dramatically. And this is creating a lot of backlash in terms of the traditional power people not willing to give up that role. But if you look around the world, some of the best functioning economies or democracies have been those that have been able to keep inequality down, or at least keep the bottom of the pyramid still engaged, still vested in the game, still vested in the system. And if we define failure as increasing inequality, then, as I say, the system is designed to fail because every time an option is presented before us, nothing is what it seems and everything is actually a veneer, a kind of screen. Right? Let me give you some examples. We have been having these debates about freebies, right? Uh, you remember all this stuff about the Supreme Court and all that. And I asked some profound questions. I said, on what basis, in what democratic country is the Supreme Court the arbiter of what politicians can and cannot say about what they will and will not deliver in an election or after an election? Now, I've not got an answer to that yet. And of course, the outgoing CJI, though he was kind enough to not mention me my name, he mentioned me my title, sitting on the bench and saying, don't think we don't know what your finance minister is saying in Tamil Nadu, right? But no answer came to my question. Under what part of the constitution is the Supreme Court, or for that matter, any court, the arbiter of what a politician can and cannot promise during an election? Who appointed them? Chaperones in the relationship? No answer. But there was all these questions about this culture, that culture, Ravdi culture, all this kind of stuff. Day before yesterday, a journalist sent me a tweet of the Honorable Finance Minister of India, the Union Finance Minister, where she has tweeted out the manifesto of the BJP in the Himachal uh, Pradesh election and talked about all the things they're going to do for women, give them free this, give them subsidy that, give them reservation this, give them all the things that the Dravidian movement did 100 years ago, they're doing now, right? So I was tempted. And then I thought, no, you know, she's very kind to me. I'll not comment on it uh, in social media. But if I were to have commented, I would have said, if imitation is the best form of flattery or the most sincere form of flattery, then surely I'm very grateful to the union finance minister because she says you should do all the things we've been doing. The same way that I say that I am a great imitator of the current prime minister when he was chief minister of Gujarat, when he fought for states' rights. Every single thing I say today about federalism or states' rights, 
he has gone further than me when he was the chief minister of gujarat so a lot of politics is just posturing a lot of politics is just noise is just fake is just arbitrary leveraging for that instance that opportunism right there are like trigger words you know there is a saying in in uh, us politics that social security is the third rail of politics you know third rail in the subway systems and the electric trains is where the current is carried you touch it you die so there used to be a saying that social security is the third rail of american politics in india we have many 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 third rails right nobody asks how much why is it fair is it equitable is it truly in keeping with my ideology all these and all the random you know secondary issues they are like political myths and clichés that have been created by the entitled class to use as kind of threat words it's almost like you know every time the word comes out immediately every all debate stops you just have to go down that that path and the lobbies are very 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 powerful so really one of the profound failings of our system is that the rich the powerful the unduly advantaged the usurpers of rights of assets have clear access to politicians have the money to do lobbying have unlimited resources to play the game can influence the press can do whatever and the large majority that is disadvantaged does not ever get heard the large majority who's losing out because the few are taking their unfair share they never get heard that is a profound problem in the way our democracy functions and that's apart from any party politics i'm not getting into and it's very few people like me who have a the courage of conviction that if i'm here i'll do it the right way if not be insurance i leave this there are other things i can do with my life this is not the end of my career this was not the beginning of it and very very few politicians have that maybe in 5 years i also will be so vested in the system 10 years that i'll worry what happens if i lose this job but at least till today it's here i do it my way if i don't i'll do other things with my life most people are not like that most people are not willing to test whether a decision is worth taking the risk you may have all seen yes minister and yes prime minister and the key word that humphrey uses to put hacker back in place says minister that is a very courageous decision <laughs> anything that requires courage every politician wants no part of right in fact i would say my learning from these 18 months on the job and really the true learning came in my 5 years as opposition mla because i got two kinds of learning one as a member of the house a member of the public accounts committee for 5 years reading hundreds of pages of audit reports seeing all the ways government could fail seeing that there was no real consequence for failure they had failed the audit would say it and then the government would do nothing right and this is not unique to tamil nadu all over the place it happens but also i had this unique opportunity because i'd come from a kind of tech heavy industry like banking and i had some idea of the value of data and systems and infrastructure my leader asked me to start the dmk it wing and i did that and i did it in a very unique way that you know i put it all out in the sunlight uh, i didn't want to do all of these hidden and bots and troll armies and all that so i went and actually recruited people village by village town by town district by district to be the backbone so that the party could build a physical to data infrastructure i must have traveled around the state three or four times a few thousand kilometers each time and i appointed i don't know a few thousand office bearers after interviewing them personally and we built a infrastructure that helped us a lot actually during covid and during elections we were able to make significant difference but at the end of the day i would say the most telling lesson that i have learned in this time the system is extremely inefficient it is designed to fail if if success is reducing inequality and giving everybody access then the system is designed to fail and everybody is vested in its failure who you can hear they are all interested in failure everybody who pays a bribe make sure they get 3x the return otherwise they can't pay the bribe or 2x the return in many cases they get 10x or 50x because politicians don't know what they're giving away for what they're taking if i was to say right now what is the actual limitation in government at least for states like tamil nadu it is not money at all we have found so many ways that money has been inefficiently spent or claimed to have been spent but actually parked in an account or we went from 7 years or 8 years of record revenue deficits last year we brought it down despite covid second wave third wave 
hugely by 16,000 crores. This year, I'm committed to bringing down another 10, 20,000 crores. And I've said that after seven, eight years of record revenue deficits, by 24, 25, we'll go to revenue neutral. That means from 62,000 crores a year in that day's money, which in three years will be more like 80,000 crores with inflation and size of the economy, we were taking that back to zero. So money is not a big thing, right? Um, and this is apart from politics. I was in a, a felicitation function in Delhi Tuesday night where uh, Union Highways and Infrastructure Minister Nitin Gadkari spoke. And he said effectively the same thing. He said the markets have unlimited liquidity. And he was kind enough and gracious enough to credit Dr. Manmohan Singh for the liberalization and for the creation of PPP models and market financing and all that. But he said, now the problem is not that. Now the problem is, can we execute? And I echo that. Across the political divide, I echo that the greatest limitation in government today is management bandwidth and administrative ability. We have huge shortfall in those things. The state of Tamil Nadu, as I said, 300 plus billion dollar economy, 38 districts, 55 departments, hundreds of boards, public sector enterprises, transport corporations, electricity, so forth. All of this managed by 34 or 35 ministers, 350 IS officers. Simply not in the realm of proper design from any organizational kind of theory or management perspective. So, you know, change comes. Some days we fight harder for it. Some days we fight less. Some days we make more progress. Some days we have to take a step back, like yesterday, day before I had some issues on something. Some days it's more frustrating. Some days it's happier. But I don't want to end on a bad note. So I'll say a few things that are positive. I go to a lot of events where people tell me, oh, you know, why can't we have more educated, more professional, more skilled people like you? And that'll solve all our problems. I always say that's a very dangerous notion. Who gets to decide what is skill, what is talent, what is professionalism? You know, in a democracy, we value the people's voice. So I'm not sure there's a third party arbiter of who is qualified, who's talented, who's professional. In any event, in my view of the world, as important as talent and understanding and, you know, tech skills and professional qualifications and all that are, experience is more important than that. And when I say experience, experience of public service, experience of how the system works or doesn't. I certainly could not imagine doing the job I'm doing today if I had not had five years as an opposition MLA. But of course, even that, I'll give you a little joke. The current ambassador, the High Commissioner to India from Australia is a gentleman called the Honorable Barry O'Farrell. Barry O'Farrell used to be uh, Chief Minister or Premier, as they call them there, of New South Wales. And so he came to see me, I think, after the third wave lifted. One of the first visits, he came down to Chennai and we had a long conversation. And I was extolling the virtues of having spent five years in opposition. I said, you know, Barry, I couldn't do this job if I had not been in opposition. And Barry listens to me very patiently and he says, yeah, you know, Tiaga, I was in opposition for 12 years and one term as premier. As far as I'm concerned, opposition is overrated. (laughs) So it's all relative, right? But I think experience is more important than talent. I think much more important than experience is empathy. I think if you don't have a connect with the people, if you don't have some measure of indignation when things go wrong, you don't have some sense of what is right, then I think it's very hard to be a good public servant. And I'm saying that's an independent dimension of corruption. People can be both corrupt and empathetic. And I would say, as far as I'm concerned, at least, if I'm able to achieve anything at all, is that my ideology is very, very, very clear. Every time I unscrew my pen, every time I open my mouth, every time I have to sign a file or send it back, I say, is this really advancing? What we say our intent is, social justice, financial inclusion, fairness, opportunity for all, Is it something that actually validates that or not? And I would say we've done a few things that we're extremely proud of, introducing the breakfast scheme for state school children. Not just the scheme, but the way we have done it, where in the villages, we do it through the parents of the children as a self-help group and give them money. And we have a natural check and balance. And in the cities where we do it through uh, IoT and automation and leveraging the startups of Tamil Nadu who help us with the... keeping the costs and down and the quality up. Because in our free lunch program, which has been running for over 100 years in some form, about 70% of the total cost goes to the labor. And less than 30% goes to food plus energy plus room plus transport plus all that stuff. 
So we didn't want another version of that. We are very proud of the remedial program we call Illum Thedi Kalvi, which has just been written up and presented at the UNDP. It was a brainchild of uh, Raghu Rajan and, I mean, not the design itself, but the focus of you must do it, you must do it, you must do it. So much so that when I was reading my response to the maiden budget and I was speaking to the chief minister the night before, I said, we have to announce something on remedial education. Otherwise, why do we have such wonderful advisors like Raghu and Esther and, uh, you know, John Dres and all that. And so at the end, we cooked up that program overnight. We announced it in the morning. And then we've executed it in a way that actually is like a Teach for America model using volunteers who are from that community. It's a bit complicated in the design. I don't want to go into it. But it has been such outstanding success. For like 2% of the education budget, we have improved the learning outcomes by 17%. Because by God's grace, we had a baseline study in 2019. Then we had a post-second wave study and now we have a new study so we can actually track it's almost the best data set in the world of something like 30,000 data points of actual students longitudinal tracking how much they lost incidentally what's earth shattering is that they actually lost two years learning in two years of lockdown meaning an eight-year-old was only reading and doing math at a six-year-old level when they came back to school and we've only been able to cover about two-thirds that gap till now So that program is a program we'll run perpetually as long as we're in power. So, you know, there are some victories. I would say one of the other things that's good about politicians, politicians are very good at assessing each other and assessing people. So whether it's the GST council, whether it's individual interactions, everybody knows who's made of what stuff, who should be given what weight. And uh, it doesn't take very long, right? Uh, I'm, I'm an unusual politician. I've only been in the role five or six years. Many politicians have been there 30, 40, 50 years. And so they have seen lots and lots of people. And the camaraderie that develops is beyond politics, right? Whether it's uh, leftist, rightist, uh, Hindi, Tamil, Canada, I've been impressed. It doesn't take very long for people to assess each other, and it doesn't take very long to build friendships and relationships. And that's actually good for the country, I think, especially when we work on things like the GST Council. I would say that in closing, you know, for me, this has been a phenomenal journey because by nature, I'm a problem solver. Something about human interaction and connecting with people invigorates me. So I find this the best job in the world. I know that I couldn't have dreamt of a better outcome to my long and winding path. And I know that nothing is permanent, right? By Good or bad luck, I was at the Twin Towers when the plane struck on 9-11. I was in the basement coming out. And I was running a few hundred employees and a couple of companies for Lehman Brothers when Lehman went bankrupt on the 15th of September. So I've seen a lot of volatility in my life. It's taught me a lot of things. But when nothing is permanent, then every day you still have hope. Even on a bad day, you lose everything. You know, you lose what seems like everything at that day. Of course, you know, some things are permanent. Death is permanent. But short of that, almost anything is recoverable. And you are never, you know, a permanent winner. There's no such thing as definitive success. And you're never a permanent loser. Everything is cyclical. You take the wins, you take the losses with less happiness, but with as much or more learning. And you learn, I think, which fight to take on which day, how to bend without breaking, So you don't have to sign it one way or the other way. And I think, you know, the great luxury for me is I'm still learning. So I think I'll do better and better at my job with every day. And I'll meet more and more interesting people, which incidentally has been fascinating. I've met politicians from around the world, diplomats from around the world. Uh, Tamil Nadu has the luxury of scale, as well as a phenomenally successful diaspora. CEOs, chairmen of big tech companies, banks. So, you know, sitting in the seat has been really the the gift and the joy of a lifetime. So maybe I should stop there. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what you heard, please share it with family and friends. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible are Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandani Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studios. 
don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.